And what works is ACT, I believe, acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a CBT technique. So then last night I was telling myself, you know what? Try that out. Accept these thoughts. Now, I'm not exactly sure what it means to accept them. I don't precisely think it means entertain them, but at least meet them not with horror and dread and avoidance, but just say, that's okay, man. You think like that? Some people feel like that sometimes. So I started doing that. And last night was the first time in the three weeks since I've had this that I felt absolutely like my regular self, almost from five minutes of this quote-unquote acceptance therapy. And then I woke up this morning, felt like my regular self, like I'm behind my eyes, I have a, I'm in this world. That was fascinating. Okay, so I said quite a few statements right there. I'm sure there's plenty you want to comment on. What I'm also interested in, for you to put a pin in your hat, is what the heck does this self-acceptance, self-love, if that's even the same, mean in terms of the free energy principle? Okay, so I basically just poured myself out there. There you go. Sorry, Carl, for you to pick up all those pieces. I know it's a huge responsibility. I trust you. You're someone who studies this. You're extremely, extremely bright, and you have such a wealth of knowledge. And I do feel like what I'm going through is not something terribly unique. I do feel like this is something that many people who are on this journey of understanding the world and consciousness and their place go through this perhaps at some point. I, th I think I was trying to emphasize that by saying that, you know, it is a gift that you're able to have these existential crises. Um, you know, there are dangers that lurk, which you've clearly encountered. But at the end of the day, the very fact that you can entertain these counterfactuals is you know, quite remarkable. You know, it, it, to my mind, it's, it, it would be the highest expression of the human condition, just to consider we are those alternative hypotheses where bits of our humanity are just not there anymore or have a, a different disposition or relationship to reality or indeed other people. There are lots of things you said made, made a lot of sense uh, from simple things like, you know, soliciting reassurance from others that you don't have to do um, any more work in terms of preparing yourself and being a good, a good uh, expounder of ideas or, 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 or interviewer or book writer or, or, or whatever. Uh, you know, that's exactly what you should be doing. That's, that's exactly securing evidence for your self-models of an affirmatory sort. Uh, and the more you do that, then the more uh, the more that model will uh, be fit for purpose, and that you will have the, the right kind of marginal maximizing your marginal likelihood. But you're in a difficult position because your job is actually to explore other ways of making sense of things and other ways of thinking things. So you're you're compelled to explore alternative hypotheses, um, and you know you, you described um, the you know the potential. Um, nihilism and um, um, the, I presume quite nightmarish, um, I, I can't now remember my nightmares, but I'm, I imagine that all of us do go through this when we have nightmares as children. I think you stop having true nightmares in your 30s and 40s, but uh, you know, the, that sort of, you know, before you've really got that grip and maintain that grip on selfhood and you in your, in your, lived, uh, in, in your lived world, as part of that and engage with that world before you've got there, you know, it must be absolutely awful and, and you know, nihilistic to, to, to occasionally lose that and then, you know, worrying that you're never going to get it back. It does remind me of certain, um, certain um, drug induced states. You know, I, I can imagine that you're the kind of person who would be very frightened of having a very bad trip. Um, and I think very um, frightened of having one. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that is correct. And luckily I wasn't, well, what I imagine what I was going through would feels like how someone would feel on a on a terrible psychedelic trip. Yes, um, and it's interesting you bring up psychedelics because, of course, you know um, th there is a move um, uh, in uh, sort of pharmacologically assisted talking therapies you know, to, to to use psychedelics simply. Um, not to aspire to, uh, I, I don't know what ego death means, but I, I, I can have a guess at it from the point of view of meditation and mindfulness. Um, but there's a really interesting connection between um, the use of psychedelics um, and the aspiration of many um, meditation-like practices um, that would, I think, subsume the intent internal attention states um, of um, 
of meditation and your know, current uh, practices of mindfulness, which is really to try and redirect your attention to the sensorium and usually the interceptive parts. So it's like breathing, for example. So this is the exact opposite of what you've been doing. It's exactly <laughs> sort of deploying that attention, all that um, um, game control we we're talking about in terms of selecting what kind of information, sensory information, sensory states to um, engage and um, determine your belief updating. So putting it, putting all that attention out to the sensory side of your deep hierarchical models, your your constructs. Uh, what you're doing is the opposite. You 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 you've been actually wandering around at the deeper, at the highest levels of these hierarchical models. That Sorry. So in back when we were initially talking, and I said there's a black box, the input output, and then there are two black boxes. It's as if you're saying, pay attention to the sensory. Forget about the action. We haven't talked much about the action, though, obviously, as embodied creatures, sensory and action are tied. It's as if what I've been doing was staying within the box and creating my little sensations and actions within there as little loops. And you're saying, pay attention to the senses that come from the outside. Is that what you're saying? Or Yes. Well, no, I'm not saying you should do, you, 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 you will do um, everything uh, in the right way under the free energy principle. Um, <laughs> what I'm saying is that the, uh, uh, what I'm just saying is that the, the skilled practitioners of mindfulness and meditation I would imagine of the kind that would lead to uh, ego death, or uh, I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, it, um, uh, w w w would employ exactly the same kind of internally mediated and sometimes, if you're very skilled, volitionally called forth mechanisms um, that are actually. Um, targeted by psychedelics that the, 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 the require you now to do all your belief updating and evidence assimilation and sense making at the much more the input level of, of the black box, not at the, if you like, the highest level, which you could think of as an output in terms of selecting the plans of what am I going to do next and what kind of person am I, narratives that we give ourselves that contextualize the way that we behave and the other things that we do. Um, so, you know, I think there's mechanistically a really interesting connection between the notion of you ruminating, going in circles around your head, exploring ever darker and darker um, uh, um, corners of your mind and different hypotheses for which there's very little evidence available simply because you're not attending to the sensorium. You're not talking to anybody. Yeah? You're not, for example, you're not, to, you're not focusing on your breathing. And indeed, you try and supplement that with an elastic band just to get yeah. yourself back to the sensorium. Ah, um, that's interesting. So, so um, I, I think that you know, you might, you may, well, you, you, uh, well, I guess you probably are um, skilled in meditation. Um, but that kind, I think, the objective of um, becoming a skilled practitioner of mindfulness or meditation is simply to get some volitional control over that sort of attention. Um, that is paid to these deeper machinations versus attention that is paid to the sensorium that underwrites the psychedelic aspect, the uh, the uh, the allure of just sensory uh, patterns and, and um, um, the sensations um, and textures that you get, you know, when when taking psychedelics. So you know, getting control of the balance. Um, um, so it's not the fact you're attending to your breathing, which is important. It's the fact that you could volitionally redirect your attention away from selfhood. Um, Extremely some interesting. Control of it. So, but you seem to have got control um, by this acceptance. And it strikes me that, you know, in the absence of um, feelings of an emotional sort that were articulated in your description in terms of, you know, I'm an awful person. I'm not fit for purpose. I, I, you know, I, I'm not well prepared. Um, I, um, I'm not able to man up and own this ego, uh, ego death. Uh, all of these right. sort of personal, but quite emotional constructs, affective, valenced um, 
aspects. They are also hypotheses. They're also explanations. So the idea is that you know anything that you can talk about has to be part of an explanation for particular ways of being. That you know I can be a worthless person, or in this is I am a worthless person. No, I'm not a worthless person. Uh, you know, and you since uh, I, I'm. Uh, in a state of anxiety. I'm not in a state of anxiety. We have to recognize when we are anxious. Anxious is just a state of being um, which is necessarily called for in certain situations that rebalance this attention or precision waiting in, um, in computational psychiatry um, to make your belief updating fit for purpose in this particular, in, in this particular uh, context. Um, what I'm trying to get to is why acceptance might have worked. Because I imagine that if you were suddenly found yourself ruminating and locked into those ruminations, um, then very much akin to someone on a bad trip who thinks, ah, I am going to be locked in this forever. This is going to be my uncertain state of being for eternity, because there is no reality. To That's get. how it feels, or how it felt, yeah. That, um, that feeling, well, well, if that is true, I must be feeling anxious. You are then going to look for evidence that you're feeling anxious. Uh, um, and because you are anxious, uh, you will experience certain cardiac acceleration, certain uh, interceptive um, flight or fr fright-like responses um, that will supply evidence that you are anxious. And then that becomes evidence, yes, I am right. I am now in a state of nihilism. I do not exist, and I should be anxious about that. And yes, I am anxious. So you get into a, 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 a vicious circle. So this is the sort of uh, good old fashioned cognitive behavioral explanation for things like panic attacks that you, know, uh, you quite reasonably in, in an entirely basoctal way, make sense of interceptive bodily gut feelings, literally. Uh, you make sense of them with the hypothesis, ah, oh, I must be in an anxious state of being. And that conclusion, that hypothesis, then generates autonomic actions that are realized reflexively in the way we were talking about um, when we look at the Parkinson's idea. Um, and that will be reflected in terms of cardiac acceleration, uh, neuroendocrine releases uh, into your body, and your body will change, and your body will supply signals, interceptive evidence. Yes, I am anxious. So it's, again, a self-fulfilling prophecy in exactly the same way that the idea motor theory means that raising my hand is just uh, a realization of my beliefs but i can literally raise my levels of anxiety in exactly the same way but invisibly from the outside but not when i can sense my own body so if you got yourself caught up into this joint hypothesis i am in a nihilistic existential state and i should be really worried about this and anxious about this then it is quite understandable that you are going to use signals of anxiety and angst generated by your body as evidence that yes, I am now um, divorced from reality. I am an unperson. I am, uh, you know, in a, in a dark and nihilistic um, um, place, uh, and there could be no other place. There could be no reality. That's a hypothesis. If you can just wait for the evidence that that hypothesis is incorrect simply by letting your body calm down so there is no further evidence of any anxiety, then you can find secure, even from your own body, even without talking to somebody, you can secure evidence. Ah, the hypothesis that I am in a state of internal nihilism and anxiety is a silly hypothesis because the evidence refutes it. I can now feel my, you know, not possibly personally, but you, you will synthesize all your interceptive feelings um, in a way that um, provides evidence against the fact that now I am in a deeply nihilistic, um, anxious state. I think that just is the motivation for the acceptance. It is pushing through to get to a state of mind and a state of body, literally you know, realising you're good at making sense of your gut feelings, so that you can now refute the joint hypothesis that I am uh, in a state of nihilism, and I should be jolly frightened about this because there's no evidence that you're frightened anymore. So this was just a piece of um, um, hypothesis building 
of a, you know, a very sophisticated and, um, uh, uh, and philosophical sort, you know, the highest level of exploring alternative ways of relating to the world, you now have, I think, a very useful insight um, into what into the gift of retaining selfhood that we I think we all we all take it for granted, but it's a quite a fragile thing, you know. Uh, luckily, um, you know, I, most of us get through the day, if not uh, hopefully uh, uh, most of our lives. Yeah, you know, by retaining that grip and just you know continue securing evidence that this is the right hypothesis. I'm a person. I am me. I am functional. This is you know this is the way I'm meant to be, and these are the kinds of things I do and the kinds of people I talk to. But that is such a fragile, self-assembled, and has to be maintained hypothesis that you do that you know that fragility. I think only is revealed occasionally and only to some people when they have the alternative hypothesis that you know i fact i'm not me or your know, me is not quite as functional as i thought i was or i'm several me or me uh, um, uh me uh, i am only me and there is no reality out there 